Uh, now I would like to welcome to the stage uh, Dr. Harold Pollack. Uh, Dr. Pollack is the Helen Ross Professor at the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration. He is the co-director co of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and a committee member of the Center for Health Administration Studies at the University of Chicago. He has published widely at the interface between poverty policy and public health. Before coming to the University of Chicago, Professor Pollock was a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Scholar in Health Policy Research at Yale University and taught Health Management and Policy at the University of Michigan's School of Public Health. Dr. Pollock is going to discuss what we know and what we can do about the violence plaguing our city here in Chicago. Quite simply, uh, this agenda would not have been complete without this discussion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Harold Pollock. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much. I always wish my mom would just be here for that introduction. And, and uh, I'm sure she would add plenty of things that, uh, that you didn't have time to mention. So I should say that, that I have several colleagues here who have uh, played critical roles in a lot of the work I'll be discussing today, uh, Nathan Hess in the back and Mark Jones. I, walking in from the back, by the way, it's very intimidating to see the size of the crowd. And I think there's others, others from the crime lab here uh, as well, uh, no doubt here as my, as my minders to make sure I don't embarrass the, the rest of the shop. They're, um, uh, I want to talk today about what we know about Chicago, and obviously Chicago faces some serious violence challenges. Uh, we did have uh, a major uh, uptick in violence, uh, you know, this past year, and uh, you know it is not uh, Dodge City here. We're still well below the levels that we were at uh, 25 years ago, but Chicago's got some challenges. And, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about what those are and how gun violence fits into that. And uh, it's certainly an honor to follow Dr. Miller and, and his work. Uh, uh, and, uh, and I hope I can keep up that standard. I, I should say that what's really striking is there was a real increase right around January of last year. And I don't think anyone totally knows what's going on to explain that, but there was a definite increase. And particularly when you try to compare us with uh, our, two pe our two peer large cities, Los Angeles and New York, uh, Chicago is more dangerous. Now because Chicago is more dangerous than Los Angeles or New York, it's very easy to believe that it's Dodge City here. And one important point is it's not. There's nothing that we are experiencing in Chicago that many, many other cities are not experiencing right now. So uh, if you look at where we are, this is, this is from, the, from the trace, we rank about number eight in the country. And you know, St. Louis, Baltimore, Detroit, uh, many cities are, uh, New Orleans, are facing the same problems that we are. Uh, and uh, you know, it is, uh, and I think that's important to understand that, uh, you know, that this is an American problem, it's not a Chicago problem by, by any means. And if you look at where homicides have gone up, our rate of homicide increase is, is significant, but there are many other cities that have also seen an increase. So we don't want to poo-poo this and say it's not happening, because it is, but we also don't want to act as if Chicago is somehow unique, uh, because it's, we're certainly far from unique. Okay? Uh, and just uh, uh, if you compare us, for example, to Baltimore, Washington, Philadelphia, uh, you know, we are the red line there. Can you see the, can you see the graph? These are from the Crime Lab's annual sort of uh, report on, on Chicago's uh, violence that, that, that came out recently. And on our website, you can actually find the full, the full data. I, I am uh, a consumer of uh, uh, most of these graphs in this report, and I certainly can't take credit for all the data, but I can tell you that the data is all true. Uh, so, uh, uh, now what is going on with homicides? I think that we, we have to think about homicides f from a couple of perspectives. You know, this, I'm from the University of Chicago, so we have to have equations in today's uh, session. So here's, here's an equation, uh, if I can get it to advance. Gun violence equals guns plus violence. It, it, gets, it gets harder after this. Uh, the, um, you know, there's the gun aspect. And I think Dr. Miller spoke very well to it in the context of suicide, and much the same is true in the context of homicide. 
that the presence of a gun uh, converts a violent situation to a lethal one. It turns out if you compare the United States to England, France, Canada, you know, if you want to get mugged to the London tube, someone would be happy to do that for you. You know, if you want your car stolen in Toronto, they can arrange for that. Uh, we have very similar rates of non-gun crime to many other wealthy democracies that have many fewer dead bodies than we have. And that gun issue is just so fundamental to that. Uh, and uh, so a lot of the work that we do at the crime lab and also the health lab at the University of Chicago, my mom would also tell you I'm the co-director of the health lab, uh, the, um, is trying to deal with self-regulation skills among young men and, and ways that we can reduce violence, uh, uh, but, and also to work on that gun piece concurrently and understand both are important. Okay? Um, here's another, this is the more advanced equation. This is, this is, I would say, uh, this is the fundamental equation in a lot of the homicides that involve particularly young men. When you look at men who are a little older, it looks a little different. But a ton of the homicides, when we started the crime lab, I just looked at 200 consecutive case reports for homicides involving uh, young men who are murdered in Chicago, uh, and, you know, high school age and a little older. And so many of those, you look at this, there would be some kind of an altercation and you read the little two-paragraph summary at the, of, at the medical examiner, and you say, I can't believe somebody's dead from this. You know, you know a fight that escalates. Uh, you know, just, just people getting into it on the street. Uh, my colleague Jens Ludwig has a, has a presentation about a case that started with a stolen bicycle. And you just say, wow, I can't believe people are, 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 are uh, being killed by this. And finding ways to deal with the self-regulation, impulsivity, and conflict escalation among young people is really important to deal with that. And our Becoming a Man intervention that Youth Guidance uh, and World Sports Chicago uh, implemented that we helped to evaluate uh, showed that we could really reduce violence among young people by, through cognitive behavioral therapy and things like that. Uh, there, I should say the alcohol issue is one that is very much underrated. People often say to me, what's the biggest drug in the inner city kind of question? And I say alcohol, and they say, no, I meant drugs. And alcohol is pretty much the ball game. And I will tell you that every single issue of my own personal safety in my entire career as a public health researcher were, uh, that involved someone that scared me who was using a substance, it was alcohol 100% of every incident in my entire career. Never had a problem with injection drug users and the work I did in needle exchanges, all this kind of stuff. Alcohol is the problem. Unless you're carrying a tray of brownies, marijuana is not that dangerous in terms of the violence potential when you encounter people who are using it. Uh, so one of the things that we did is we looked at alcohol in the blood of people that were found murdered. And this is actually data that's getting a little old now. It's 2005 to 2009, but it's northern Illinois. And what we found was that a third of the young people who were murdered had high BAC levels and almost nothing else in their systems, really. I mean, they would have all had marijuana in their system if you tested for it, partly because marijuana shows up in a, you know, for a long time, but, uh, but it is, uh, alcohol really is the issue, and especially for women or a, a crime or murder that did not involve a gun. Alcohol was just present so often. And, um, and actually, there's some wonderful work that was done by a Northwestern University group, but I can, I'll still uh, uh, cite them. Uh, well, Linda Teplin and her colleagues uh, looked, tracked young people who had been in the juvenile detention center and looked at who, was, who died as you tracked them forward. And what they found was that people with alcohol disorders were actually more likely to be murdered than people who were selling drugs, for example. And uh, now, and alcohol disorders often came with other kinds of comorbidities, but so I just put this in here to point out that alcohol is so fundamental, okay? There, um, now, let me get back to the gun issue now that I've, uh, uh, I just like to always talk about alcohol because we tend to ignore it. Okay. Um, so, so, uh, so now let's talk about homicides with a firearm. So in Chicago, about almost 90% of our homicides involve a gun, and it's usually a handgun. Uh, and, uh, you know, that, that, is how people, that is how people are murdered in Chicago typically. Uh, and if you look, not surprisingly, by the way, the disparity in those things are huge. And, you know, young, uh, young African-American men are really the dominant victims of homicide in Chicago. 
Uh, some of my colleagues sometimes say to me, you know, oh my, I'm really scared. How am I going to live in Chicago? I keep reading the newspaper, all these bad things. And, and I say, well, since you're a middle-aged University of Chicago professor living in Hyde Park, you're, you're basically okay. Uh, for, you know, you, um, but what you need to do is find ways to help the people who are at higher risk. Um, one of the things that, uh, uh, that my colleagues found when they put together this lovely report was that about five neighborhoods in Chicago accounted for a third of uh, Chicago homicides and most of the increase that we saw coming you know, from 2016. And there was Austin, Englewood, West Englewood, North Lawndale, back of the yards. Uh, if, you, um, uh, if you read the paper in Chicago, these are names that are familiar to you. And you know, Chicago homicides are just v are highly concentrated on the south and west sides of our city, and uh, uh, and that's just that's just where those homicides are happening. Okay. Uh, Chicago has a lot more guns than our peers. If you ask our peers, being the cities that we are compared to, who are safer? If you look at if you compare Chicago to New York and Los Angeles. Uh, the Chicago Police Department in some years will capture, will recover more guns than New York and Los Angeles put together. Not, not by rate, but by absolute number. And, you know, the Chicago Police Department is good, but they're not, uh, you know, we don't think they're that much better than the New York and the Los Angeles uh, Police Department. Uh, you know, the rate of gun carrying in Chicago is, is profound, actually. I'll, uh, I'll back up one. If, if you look at the rate, we're, we're over twice the rate of New York and Los Angeles in, in gun recoveries. And so a lot of these incidents that involve young men on the street in Chicago, it's much more likely that one of them will have a gun. And actually, there's a shift towards higher caliber guns. We're often asked, you know, what kinds of weapons are used? And my, my colleague Mark Jones knows a lot more about this than I do. I, actually, I just wanted to make sure if he was checking his email, so I figured I'd mention his name. There, uh, the, uh, uh, but, um, uh, it's not so much the people using the AR-15s and th assault weapons, things like that, but they are using more powerful guns, more you know, higher caliber semi-automatic pistols, often with the high capacity magazines on them, uh, and and uh, and that leads to that leads to more death. And um, uh, we also see some other trends in Chicago. I want to mention, which is one is there has been a decline in arrests. People often ask us about that. The, the decline that we've seen is actually, sh I think, shows a pretty sensible set of uh, decisions by the Chicago Police Department, which is there's a decline in narcotics arrests, particularly involving people that they don't regard as dangerous. Uh, but there actually hasn't been a decline in, in arrests for different kinds of crimes uh, that we're really scared about. Uh, now, who is it that is... Uh, Offending, and who is it that's being killed in Chicago? One one of the poignant things, and then, and it's an, and as in the previous presentation, it's a little uncomfortable to talk about this. We know who a lot of the people are who are killed and being killed. There, if you look at the, the work of uh, uh, Andy Papakristos, has has looked at networks of people that he's constructed based on who was arrested together, and he's constructed these ingenious social network diagrams and has found that almost everybody murdered in Chicago is in this network of people who've been co-arrested together. And if you're, and if you're, co if you're arrested with someone who uh, is one handshake away from someone who has a gun, you're more likely to be involved in gun violence. And there's a whole variety of ways that people are not randomly uh, mixed together in Chicago. You know, the social networks matter a lot. And you know, if you have a young African American man in one of the man in one of those five neighborhoods that I just talked about, and he's not in this network of people that are being arrested together, his risk of being murdered is actually low. Uh, you know, it's it's his next door neighbor who uh, who is who is in this co arresting network who is a much higher risk. Okay? And you know, and we do find that you know homicide offenders and victims are much more likely to have multiple arrests and things like that, and so. Using, using data methods to try to do a better job of identifying who's at higher risk is one way we might be able to prevent some of the homicides by, by channeling resources on people who need help. And, 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 uh, and that's one, one strand of our work. So uh, let me get to uh, uh, some of the challenges that we have in understanding the underground gun market. You know, everyone understands that using a gun as part of a violent crime 
should be a priority for the police department to go out and find people and arrest them. You know, that, that's, what, that's, that's part of the core mission of every urban police department in America. Uh, what gets complicated is what do you do about the guys who are caught carrying a gun but who haven't done anything with that gun that is other, otherwise a crime, even if the gun possession is often illegal. And that's where uh, we have a challenge because what's really happening in a lot of these neighborhoods that I'm talking about is young guys are walking around armed because they're scared of each other. And how do you disrupt that arms race? And, and there's no beautiful way to do it because more, higher deterrence against gun crime can be very helpful to reverse that cycle. And things like stop and frisk have, in places, helped with that. They also have a tremendous human cost and raise tremendous legal and constitutional challenges as well. And there's no beautiful way to unravel uh, that arms race. Now, one of the striking things that we find in Chicago is... A lot. If you if you listen to people talking on uh, the news, you'll sometimes get the sense that getting a gun is about as easy as going into McDonald's and buying a hamburger or something like that. It's not. It turns out that if you look at uh, the underground gun market in Chicago, there are some people who have ready access to guns, and there are a lot of people who don't. And one of the ways that we can keep everyone safe is by focusing on the transactions that we might be able to block that's, that there's an angry young man, 22-year-old guy who wants to get hold of a gun, and we can often stop that person from getting a gun or delay that person from getting a gun, which gives us some time to intervene to deal with whatever the issue is that he might uh, use that gun to commit violence for. And uh, so it, it turns out that uh, Anthony Braga and Phil Cook and Jens Ludwig and others have done uh, studies of the underground gun market in Chicago. And, uh, and it turns out that there's a lot of criminals who have trouble getting guns. And there's other criminals who have a very easy time getting guns. And we've been trying to understand how we can disrupt that market. And I think one of the things we have to fight is the idea, you know, there's just so many guns out there that there's nothing that we can do about that. Because that's a recipe for passivity. You know, I would love for us to have public policy like they do in England about guns. That's not going to happen in the United States. And we can't, you know, we need, we need to find ways within our legal and constitutional and cultural frame that we can make it harder for dangerous people to get hold of guns. Uh, and, and that's what a lot of our work tries to do. Now, one thing that we found is that about 11% of uh, gun offenders directly buy their guns from a gun store when we look at Chicago stuff. How am I doing on time? Am I doing okay? Yeah. The, um, and so what's happening with the other 89%? It turns out we know way too little about what happens. You know, one thing about a gun is that it's a very durable object. You know, this iPhone two years from now, I'm going to basically be selling it at a garage sale or whatever. You can have a gun from 1985 and it, or 1965, and it'll shoot you dead. You know, they, and so guns typically pass uh, from hand to hand. Almost every gun used in a crime in America was legally manufactured and sold to somebody uh, you know, in a legal way coming out of the manufacturer. And so you know, that, that gun is sent to a gun store, someone buys it, it passes from hand to hand, and then at some point we recover that gun. Maybe we arrest somebody and he's got a gun on him after he's committed a crime. That gun has passed through three or four other people or five or six other people before it got to that final person. And we know a lot about the initial purchase and we know a lot about the final person who possessed it, but we often don't know a lot about what's happening in between. And that's what a lot of... We're, we actually think that's a very fruitful area of, of research that uh, the Joyce Foundation and other funders have helped us research. So we, you know, we have one set of papers that sort of started with the original purchaser, and we looked at you know, where were the guns originally sold that were recovered in crimes in Chicago. And we did find, by the way, that Indiana seems to be a distinctive issue, particularly for our gang guns. You know, one of the challenges we have is that we have local gun regulation and we have a national gun market. And that's just a fundamental challenge. You can, from my house, I can bike ride to my office, and I can bike ride to the Indiana border and, uh, you know, go buy a gun. And, uh, you know, that's a real challenge. And so, so having a national handle on what's going on is part of the answer. And finding a way to do that, that that we can live with as a nation and public policy is a real challenge. 
The second thing that we did was uh, Phil Cook, Susan Parker, and I, with the help of RSS associates, uh, surveyed people in the Cook County Jail. And we, our interviewers just went and talked to people that were gun offenders or who did crimes that were often committed with guns and asked them a lot of questions about, you know, uh, where did you get your gun? How do you store it? Uh, you know, how do you, you know, what, what was your motive for getting hold of that gun? All kinds of questions about it. And, uh, and one of the most remarkable things about the survey was that people were willing to actually tell us stuff. You know, you might think that people in the jail, who's going to tell you stuff? They did. Uh, although I must say, we did make one tactical error, which was a lot of, some of our, some of our key interviewers were these very, very uh, uh, sort of uh, energetic and engaging young women. And they went into the jail and they say to this 23-year-old man, tell, I know you're the expert about guns. Tell me, answer my questions because I don't know anything. And these guys were like, I actually don't know anything about guns, but am I actually going to say that to this uh, young woman? You know, uh, So they would make up stuff. <laughs> to, to, and so, so we would have great interviews and I would go to Mark Jones and my other colleagues and I would say, and they would say, you know that he's just completely making this up, don't you? And so there, is, you know, there, there are the realities of survey research that don't always make it into the final paper. Uh, but it was really striking when we talked to them, and I should tell you that the people we talked to, they were very criminally active people. Uh, on average, they were arrested 13 times, and they looked a lot like the uh, you know, peep criminals that, are, that were arrested on the streets of Chicago. And we asked them, where did you get your gun? The most common place they got their gun was from a person who they trusted in some way or another. You know, they're afraid of the Chicago police. People often think that criminals are not influenced by law enforcement, but they are. They, and they don't actually know what the police do to try to catch people who are, who are involved in the gun trade. You know, how are you supposed to know if you're just a kid in Chicago whether the Chicago Police Department has a lot of undercover officers pretending to sell you a gun? How are you supposed to know that? You know, they, they're worried about stuff that CPD doesn't even do. Not that we told them that. I don't think CPD would be real happy if we told them, uh, if we gave away their trade secrets. But you have to have someone who trusts you enough and you trust them enough so they're willing to get you a gun and you're willing to deal with them in a gun transaction that's illegal. And so it's, it's often family or friends or uh, you know, someone that's maybe a friend of a friend. We don't actually see too much in gun shows. We can talk about that. Some of the things you hear about in the popular press, a lot of the places where the... Uh, uh, people who commit, you know, mass shootings and so on. That's not what these folks look like. They're ordinary criminals. They're actually not, uh, you know, they're not, they're not uh, dangerous people in the sense of being, I want to shoot eight people. They're like, I need a gun because I'm selling drugs or I need a gun because I'm afraid to get home. Uh, and uh, we also looked, we did the same survey in, uh, in the prison. And we actually found uh, some of the same things. And most people, we asked, where did you get your guns? Most of them buy their guns, but a surprising number get guns as gifts. They borrow guns. They share guns. Sorry, this is, this is Edward Tufty, for those of you that do PowerPoint stuff. He would shoot me right now for this PowerPoint because it's such a low-quality thing. Uh, but you know, what we found is people get guns from their informal social network. And, you got, and to deal with that underground gun market, that's what you've got to deal with. Uh, a couple other things to say about that. One is a lot of the guns that people had, we, we looked in our, in our prison survey, we linked up the, uh, the people that, uh, that we were interviewing with what we knew about the guns they used in their crimes. And one thing that we did find was about a third of the offenders had gotten a gun and had used it for a crime within about two weeks of, uh, you know, of, of getting it. And this is, just, this is when they got caught. So guns are typically pretty old, but people don't have guns very long before they commit a crime. And so, get, so interfering with those transactions could have a real benefit because sometimes people really want a gun for something that's happening right now or next week. And uh, so, so what we, you know, this, this, uh, if you look at this is a survival curve which uh, that goes out to about six months of, uh, of you know, the, eight, the time to crime of a gun that somebody obtained. And there was a surprising number that just really got a gun pretty quickly. Uh, we did find that not too many of our, of our people were stealing guns directly. In our jail survey, only about 2% of the people steal uh, guns. In our prison survey, it was more like 10%. This is actually an important and politically polarized issue, which I didn't realize before I studied this issue. A lot of people who are 
more skeptical of uh, what you know more aggressive gun safety regulations say. Well, these regulations won't work because people can steal guns so easily. And what and what we found is that's really not what criminals are typically doing. But it varies from city to city. In low regulation cities where people go around with guns a lot, there's more gun theft because people know how to get a gun. You know, in St. Louis, the police chief of St. Louis likes to say that you know, if you want to get a gun in St. Louis, it's pretty easy to do. You go to Bush Stadium on the day of a Cardinals game and you look for a white pickup truck parked a block away and you go straight for the glove compartment. And you're going to find a gun there. That doesn't really work in Chicago because we just don't have that high rate of gun ownership and use. Uh, so, so we did find, so in New Orleans, our colleagues in New Orleans have found more gun theft than we see here. But here in Chicago, we don't see that much. Uh, but once a gun is stolen, of course, it can be put into the underground market. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done on that. Uh, Self-defense is a very powerful motivator for, uh, for gun ownership and possession. I, I can't under I can't emphasize that enough. So the the in our in our jail survey, forty percent of the people that we talked to had been shot in their adult life. I didn't actually believe this at first, but we got the same results in our prison survey, and we could actually find the incident reports of the shootings for a lot of the people to verify that this had happened. So you know, you say to somebody, "Why are you carrying a gun?" and they say, well, "Why do you think?" And you know, a lot of them would say things like, I'd rather be judged by 12 than carried by six. But whenever you hear something like that, you know it's a hip hop lyric. Because you know, when you start, you know, if you hear it more than once, it's definitely hip hop. So, um, and you know, a lot of these same people we're interviewing, they would say things to the interviewers like, you know, you gotta do something, there's way too many guns out on the street. And the interviewer would say, dude, you're a 22 year old gang offender caught with a gun. Like, aren't you exactly the person that that you were talking about. And he was like, yeah, because I'm afraid of the other 22-year-old guy who's carrying a gun. And, that, and that's what we're up against. Uh, so, um, uh, so we look, we didn't see, as I said, we didn't see that much use of, oops, we didn't see that much use of gun shows. We didn't see too much uh, use of the internet either. People were getting guns, you know, on the street in various ways. And we didn't see too much direct theft. So, uh, so what we saw are these transactions uh, that we have to somehow in, uh, interfere with. And, I'll, and I'll, I'm just going to show you a couple more slides, and then I'm going to stop. I have, I have 9,000 more slides. <laughs> but I don't think that they're uh, that, they're that important. Um, one is, you know, people think about the gun market. Like, there's going to, what we have to do is, there's Mr. Big, who's bringing up a trainload of guns from Mississippi. We've got to find that person and intercept him. And if, if, if the U.S., you know, if, if the FBI and ATF and CPD could find that person and arrest that person, everybody would be ecstatic. But it's a lot more, it's not so much like the heroin cocaine problem where you have people bringing up the stuff, you know, major organizations. The big gangs in Chicago actually don't sell guns particularly to outsiders. You don't make a lot of money selling a gun. You know, if I sell you cocaine, I can sell you cocaine every day for the next five years. Uh, if I sell you a gun, you're going to buy like three from me, and plus you might go out and shoot somebody, and then that gun might come back to me. And so, you know, Latin kings, they, they got better things to do than to sell people guns. They really, they, you know, that's not their thing. Um, it's a lot more, it's not heroin or cocaine, it's a lot more like oxycodone. You know, where, there's, where you have a legal product, and there's lots of rivulets that get into the illegal market from legal things. So you have someone who who is going, maybe they have a cousin who is, who is going to college in Missouri or Virginia, and they buy a couple guns and they bring them back. Uh, or you have someone who's, who's, she's worried about someone in her family, and he says, can you buy me a gun? You know, can you go over into Indiana and buy me a gun? And, uh, and she's, you know, she says, yeah. And we actually don't know enough about who the straw purchasers are. There's a sort of stereotype that it's like, you know, like it's like the guy goes out and gets his girlfriend to go buy him one. And that's sometimes what straw purchasers look like. Sometimes they're a little more professional. And, uh, you know, they do this. It's a sideline. Um, but we have to find ways to deter people who are the million little small fish who are selling a few guns at a time and bringing them into this market. And they know that they're not important enough for law enforcement to spend a lot of time on them. So there's a sense of impunity that comes from being involved at that low level 
that we don't know how to disrupt. You know, if you imagine that you are the state's attorney and you're like, oh, you know, we just caught this woman because she sold four guns. I'm going to spend six months making a case and then, the, and then she's going to go and the jury's going to look at her and she's, it's actually, she's kind of a sympathetic person and she really didn't mean for anybody to get hurt uh, by giving these guys this gun. Maybe someone did, maybe someone didn't. And she's going to get a pretty minimal sentence if I convict her. You know, it's not worth my time as a prosecutor to go do that. You know, I could go and arrest some white collar criminal that's going to make me look a lot better or some gang leader. And so we don't know. So the deterrent message towards this market is more limited than, than, it, than it needs to be. But it's something that we could change over time. You know, it used to be the case 25, 30 years ago. If you thought about, say, under, underage drinking is a similar analogy. How do we keep young people away from alcohol? You know, you can't go and, and uh, you know, put everybody who gives a teenager a beer five years in prison, but you can still do things that deter that behavior and change social norms around that behavior and make a real difference. So, you know, I, I want to have some room for question and answer. So I think I'm going to stop here, but, I, but I'm certainly happy to talk about a lot more. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pop. Uh, tell you what, if you would, we have about 10, 12 minutes for questions. If you'll pass the questions on the note mm -hmm. cards to the center aisle, people pick them up and... Let me go ahead while we're, while we're waiting for mm -hmm. that. Well, you have identified a lot of issues, a lot of problems. What, uh, do you have some particular policies that you think that the city of Chicago could adopt? Well, right I, think, I think there's a couple of things. I think one is how we allocate resources to investigations. You know, if you look at, uh, in Chicago, when there's a non-fatal shooting, the clearance rate for those is about 5%. And... The clearance rate, by the way, when there's a homicide is about 25%. And you might think, why is the clearance rate higher when there's, when, you know, you lose a witness when somebody's murdered. You might think there'd be a lower, but it's because there's a greater investment of resources and because the witnesses are actually more cooperative when a loved one has been killed or a friend has been killed. And I think we have to think about, are we allocating our resources and investigations well? Uh, and that's one, that's one thing that the city of, of Chicago can do. I think that undercover work to deter people from uh, uh, buying and selling guns is valuable. And I think at a national level, I would certainly say that clamping down on the background checks and things like that would be very valuable as well. Uh, no one of these is the polio vaccine, but they would all help. So universal background checks, for instance. Do you think it would make a big difference? Yes, I do. And, uh, and I think, by the way, there's best practices of, of gun selling that could help also. There's a lot of little measures we could do that, you know, for, you know in the southwest suburbs of Chicago, uh, you know, there was a lawsuit that led to the local gun store in the southwest suburbs to start doing things like videoing transactions. And there's, a, and, and there's good reason to think straw purchasers are, are less likely to come in there and try to do that. It raises the perceived risk. And I think we can do, we can chip away at this in, with those types of regulations. Um, you, you mentioned, and maybe you've addressed this, uh, you know, the problem with, as you call it, the arms race, the, the kids that are carrying the guns to defend themselves. Mm -hmm. um, what can we do? I mean, I mean, are we not arresting uh, the ones with illegal guns? Well, you know, taking I, the guns? I think, by the way, both liberals and conservatives need to learn from each other on some of these policy issues. I think that there's a lot that can be done. Uh, you know, we do a lot of prevention work. I mentioned becoming a man to help young people deal more safely with each other. We know there's been a... Sarah Heller did a beautiful randomized trial of youth summer jobs and how that reduced violent offending. There's a lot we can do on the prevention side there's a lot we can do on the deterrent side, too, and I think, I think we need to focus more explicitly on guns in our deterrence operations in law enforcement, which means that we have to do it a little bit less on some of the other stuff. So one of the very heartening trends that I see in law enforcement is I'm, I'm involved in two randomized trials of people involved selling uh, drugs who are not viewed as dangerous. And Chicago Police Department is saying, we don't want to arrest these people. And one reason they don't want to arrest these people is they want to go to communities and say, we want to focus on the gun people. Help us with the gun people, and we know that you're concerned about mass incarceration, so we're going to pull back on some of the other things that are less uh, directly related to violence. And I, and I, I do think that, uh, I do think though that, that we have to be more willing to incarcerate people who are actually doing things with guns and less willing for the people who are not doing things with guns. And, and so...
Let me ask this. Uh, I, I've seen something about this, the ceasefire program mm -hmm. in Chicago. Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, uh, I have not researched ceasefire, but I have gone around with ceasefire interrupters, and I know, and I know uh, several of the people involved in the cure violence. Hey, you mean you mean the Chicago uh, ceasefire cure violence model? There's also a Boston ceasefire. Uh, the um, I. Although I, I have not researched to verify this directly myself, when I have gone around with interrupters, people in communities are happy that they are there, and they provide a valuable mediating presence that some that, that I think, whether it's them or someone else, is very valuable. There has to be a way. You know, Harold owes Anthony $100, and this could escalate to violence. There needs to be somebody who says, you know what, I really don't care why you owe him that $100. What I really want is that nobody gets killed. You know, Anthony's got a young son. You really don't want to, you really, you really don't want to escalate this thing. Why don't you come to my office? You guys can work it out. You don't lose any face because you're doing me a favor rather than giving in to him. And let's see if we can mediate this. I think that is, uh, there's a role for that in some way. Now, making that work is a big challenge because, because uh, and the interrupters are one piece of ceasefire. They also do things like they have mediators in the emergency departments that try to talk to family members to prevent retaliations right after a shooting. I'm happy that they are there, even though I can't speak directly to the, to the uh, uh, X's and O's of the research. I should mention, I'll, I'll get a couple more here. What we're probably going to need to do is and we can post on the website after we're finished some additional questions that we didn't have time to get to and uh and post responses there i'll try to be a little more succinct okay. sorry no 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 it's just, uh i'm advised that there's a bill being uh considered in the illinois senate uh judiciary committee this tuesday uh that would encourage best practices for gun dealers the bill would license gun dealers um, and allow for law enforcement inspections. This is one evidence-based policy proposal based on crime lab data. How can people use the data to support this bill? So I'm going to be mealy-mouthed about, about supporting or opposing any particular piece of legislation, uh, uh, but I will say that that type of measure, uh, you know, is 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 a good way to proceed, uh, you know, without without endorsing the details of any particular bill. And that, and actually, if you go to the University of Chicago Crime Lab website, you'll find lots of data that we have about what we know about where guns are coming from uh, that that are used in crimes in Chicago, and, uh, and 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 there's a wealth of information there. And we'd be happy to provide to provide further information. I'm going to run for Congress, you know, so I have to practice these evasive answers. I have, have a couple of questions uh, <laughs> relating to the low homicide clearance rates. Uh, considering the low clearance rates, uh, how can you make any determinations about who shoots or kills others? You know, that is such a tragic problem that we have, and it's so deep in Chicago. And, you know, where we have community and police there's a human story on both sides, and, and finding ways to bridge that divide is one of the biggest challenges we face in the city of Chicago. And uh, you know, it certainly wasn't created overnight. Uh, and one of the things that I find most tragic about that is that the most, is that the loudest voices on each side, I think, increase the polarization. When I look at the statements that people say the leaders of the FOP are making about Black Lives Matter, and the way that that gratuitously alienates communities. The fact that they endorsed, uh, that the National Union endorsed Donald Trump, when you think about the communities that police operate in in Chicago. But then when I look at some of the Black Lives Matter folks as well, and they need to find a way to reach out to the human reality of being a police officer in Chicago too. And we have to find a way that the people on each side of the line can find each other. I actually find that one of the most helpful things we could do uh, and that, I think minority officers in Chicago have a unique perspective that often bridges those worlds in a very valuable way. 
Uh, I think also on the clearance rate, the thinking about how we allocate resources, I think it's easy to, I'd like to see more resources devoted to sort of good old detective work in some of these cases. And, uh, and I, I think that there's a good need for research to say, where should we focus those police resources? Maybe my colleagues at the Crime Lab have other ideas, but those are some ideas that come to mind for me. Uh, another question, this may have to be the last one before the break. Uh, will increased penalties for unlawful uh, weapon use, for example, increasing the statutory minimum to seven years, reduce gun violence in Chicago? And, uh, and then just generally, what impact could tougher penalties have? Well, I do think that deterrence is important. Most of the research suggests that raising the probability that someone's going to get caught gets you more than raising the max, raising the sentence. Somebody who would commit a crime when the sentence is five years, I really don't see that they're going to change their behavior a whole lot if you change that to seven years. But I think it is important that people have a sense that something will actually be done. And I, I, will, I will serve some time for something if I'm caught with this gun. I, I'm not a big believer in the heavy minimums, partly because I think community legitimacy becomes a real issue. And when I've talked to people in communities about this issue, uh, people say, you know, Dr. Pog, we love you. You have great PowerPoints and stuff. But because I was, I was supported some of these minimums. And people in communities were saying to me, you know, somebody who was just as well-intentioned as you were and had just gave the same awesome PowerPoints as you do, she told us about the crack epidemic 20 years ago. And... And we supported some pretty harsh penalties then because we were worried about crack and it hurt our community. And so we're up against that, that community conversation that we have to engage. And I think if the minimums are too high, then you will lose legitimacy and then people will not help the police find the people. Uh, I, thank you. Thank you.